You are listening to the Tractor Time Podcast. We are proud to be sponsored by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers and homesteaders. BCS is often mistaken for just a rototiller, but with gear-driven transmissions and dozens of professional quality implements, they truly make superior pieces of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy, where small farms are way alive, BCS two-wheel tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agriculture equipment, the kind of dependability every farm needs. BCS America can supply tools you need to get jobs done across the farm and the homestead. Even on large farms where a four-wheel tractor is a necessity, BCS two-wheel tractors will tackle jobs that simply can't be done with larger machines. From mowing steep slopes and along pond banks to working soil in high tunnels and hoop houses, check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments and watch videos of BCS in action. Again, thanks to BCS America for sponsoring today's episode. We are in a revolution, but it is a revolution in which the side that fires the first shot loses. We will not fire any shots because our weapon is uncommon good sense. Good day and welcome to the Tractor Time podcast brought to you by Acres USA, the voice of eco-agriculture. I'm your host, Ryan Slabel, and we are humbled to bring you the 30th episode today. Uh, Our topic is one we have to talk about, but it's not a whole lot of fun, Monsanto. Uh, Our guest today, Kerry Gillum, is a veteran reporter who has been covering corporate America for 25 years, including Monsanto and most recently Bayer. This year, she's been busy covering the Monsanto trials. Uh, She's been suing agencies under the Freedom of Information Act to get these vital materials to do her reporting. Uh, She's discovering an amazing array of corruption that is fueling the more than 11,000 lawsuits currently in court against the company. Uh, Mainly, she's uncovered the fact that Monsanto has lied to and tricked farmers, land managers, growers, ranchers, myself, city managers, Uh, just about everybody for 50 years about Roundup, that they tell their employees to behave differently around the product than they do their consumers, and that they paid for fake science, they paid off reporters, they got especially cozy with politicians around the world. Uh, France's parliament is exploring charges that they kept a list of politicians they liked and disliked. Uh, That's nothing new to us here in the U.S., but that level of targeted lobbying does not go over so well elsewhere in the world. And the bottom line is, their product is toxic to human and animal health, and juries are who have heard their defenses do not see any redemption in their defenses. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, our peers have said that their lying has only added to the penalties and that their liability is now range in the trillions of dollars. Uh, Bear's stock price is 40% decline from where it was at the time they purchased Monsanto. Don't hold me to that. This is a long-term uh, podcast, but uh, it's caused a lot of volatility in their company. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Here's a soundbite from Canadian Public Broadcasting Channel's recent coverage, which I thought summarized the issue very well. Uh, Special thanks to them. Lee Johnson, a San Francisco groundskeeper whose job involved spraying Roundup, is now dying of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. In August, he won a multi-million dollar lawsuit against Monsanto, now owned by Bayer, when the jury ruled Monsanto should have warned him about a possible link to cancer. Monsanto disagrees with the decision and is appealing it. And here is one more soundbite I thought was especially helpful. What is glyphosate? It's the active ingredient in top-selling weed killers like Roundup. Monsanto first introduced Roundup in 1974, and it now helps the company make billions of dollars every year. It's sprayed on some of our biggest crops, like soybean, corn, canola, and wheat. What's it in? Well, it could be in your favorite beer or wine. You'll find it all across supermarket shelves. Environmental Defense Canada tested a number of products from Kraft Dinner, chocolate glazed Timbits, and found glyphosate in most of them. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency did a test too and found 30% of their samples contained the chemical. But here's the thing, the CFIA didn't include wheat and corn. Radio Canada dug up what the CFIA didn't publish, and it turns out 70 to 80 percent of their wheat and corn samples contained glyphosate. It's the same here in the U.S. Uh, agencies looking only into part of the story, not the whole story. Uh, Carrie Gillum documents all of that uh, very well. And to be clear, we are talking about the specific formulation Monsanto uses in its Roundup product that includes glyphosate. It's an important distinction. It's not glyphosate itself. It's the 
chemical formulation of Roundup that is at the essence of a lot of these trials. Monsanto's spokespersons deny all of this. They say there's no proof that the product is unhealthy and shouldn't be used. Uh, you can still find it everywhere, too. It's uh, in towns and cities and Home Depots and Lowe's. Uh, it, it has been banned by Costco. Uh, and some towns and cities are starting to make it illegal to use. Uh, but its use is still prolific. Um, so the, all this coverage is coming out. We're finally being educated about the true impact of spraying Roundup everywhere. Uh, and who's fueling this worldwide coverage? It's our guest today, Carrie Gillum. She wrote a book called Whitewash, The Story of a Weed Killer, Cancer, and the Corruption of Science. It was published by Island Press in 2017. Uh, the way she threads her reporting in with the current events paints a really damning picture of Monsanto and Roundup uh, and you know, garnered praise from environmentalists like Aaron Brockovich. Uh, she's our guest today, and she makes a strong point that banning Roundup or glyphosate or suing for billions of dollars really doesn't solve the problem, though, right? It, it does not solve the problem we are facing that in agriculture and our food supply is dependent on the lies that Monsanto has been giving farmers and the safety nets uh, are a bit too far away right now for a lot of farmers to feel comfortable leaping from the systems that Monsanto sold them. Uh, it's our listeners like you who are really going to be solving this problem, right? You guys are going to be taking the information Carrie gives us today uh, that is educated uh, the world right now on the forces at work in the herbicide industry and how we can make informed, healthy choices. Uh, you can make a difference by how you grow our food, the food you buy at the store, and by the manner in which we defend eco-agriculture. I'll say that again. We can all make a difference by how we grow our food, the food we buy at the store, and by the manner in which we defend eco-agriculture. So enough of me blabbering. Let's get into the interview with our guest today, a former senior correspondent for Reuters International Root News Service, the current research director for the consumer group U.S. Right to Know. Uh, Carrie Gillum's areas of expertise include biotech, crop technology, agrochemicals, pesticide product development, and the environmental impacts of the American food production. Uh, Carrie has been recognized as one of the top journalists in the country covering these issues. And a special thanks to our sponsor, BCS America, for making this happen today. Carrie Gillum, welcome to the Tractor Time podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, where are you calling in from? Help us paint the scene. Sure. Well, I um, live in the Kansas City area in a suburb of Kansas City metropolitan area. I'm on the Kansas side, close to close to the wheat farmers out here. Uh, I grew up actually fairly close to there, so we'll have to t tell share stories at some <laughs> other uh, time down the line. But uh, uh, really happy to happy happy to have you on the episode today. We're going to talk a lot about the trials this year with Monsanto and the consumer trials. We're going to talk about your book Whitewash, which was uh, really kind of uh, set the stage for everything that's happening right now uh, and get into details and really talk about what farmers need to take away from all of this information that's coming out of the trials at this point as well. So uh, first things first, let's set the stage a little bit about uh, who you are, Carrie, uh, just in case folks haven't uh, read your book or are familiar with your work. Um, you are a journalist and what got you into journalism? Well, you know, it's the only job I, I ever wanted. I, um, I never wanted to be anything else from the time I, I think around 12 years old, you know, when people are really starting to say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I knew I loved uh, talking to people and asking questions. I loved sort of travel and adventure. And, uh, you know, I was a child of the, I was uh, grown up in the, in the seventies, uh, early seventies. And my parents had the, the Watergate hearings on the television all the time. So I was very in tune to sort of investigations and investigative reporting. And as I got older, all the president's men became my very favorite movie ever. Um, the story of, you know, the, the Washington post journalists who uncovered the, the scandal of the Nixon administration. And so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be that I wanted to be a journalist and, uh, went to college at university of Kansas, got my journalism degree and, um, have been doing journalism for 30 years now, uh, ever since my, I spent most of my journalism career with Reuters, the international news agency. And, uh, was a national correspondent covering corporate America, and a large part of my beat, my responsibility was to cover all things Monsanto and agriculture and farming and commodity trading and grain handling. So, um, you know, that, that's how the book came about, and that's, that's how I've come to be so passionate about my work with food and agriculture. Thank you. That um, uh, just like the rest of us, that movie, uh, all the president's men got everybody got got a, got a lot of us into journalism at that point. So, and it still is, I think, getting people into journalism uh, to this day. Um, so, you, 
so you started with routers. You started uh, focusing on Monsanto. Um, uh, eventually, a book came out of this coverage. Uh, could you talk about whitewash a little bit and kind of where 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 did the book idea start? Yeah, well, I, I started covering Monsanto in 1998. Reuters assigned me to move here to Kansas, actually. Uh, I was born here, but I didn't really grow up in Kansas. Um, and I was working in Atlanta covering the banking industry. And Reuters asked me to move here because Monsanto had just introduced uh, these, you know, things called genetically engineered crops. And uh, it was revolutionizing um, agriculture and, and practices that farmers engaged in in their fields. And, and you know, a big part of, of genetically engineered crops uh, was Roundup <laughs> Ready, the use of Roundup or, or glyphosate-based herbicides that Monsanto was selling. And, you know, that back then, a lot of people didn't really realize it, but the main reason Monsanto introduced these new genetically engineered crops was to um, control and expand its Roundup market. It had had Roundup herbicide on the market since the 70s. It was about to lose its patent in the year 2000, and it really wanted to control that, that market share um, and expand it as, as generics came to the market. So the company rolled out Roundup Ready crops, and uh, like it predicted, in sales of, of Roundup or glyphosate-based herbicides just exploded. And we've seen an explosion of use of this chemical to become the most widely used herbicide in the world. So, you know, I, I tracked all of that. I studied all of that and spent a lot of time with Monsanto in their headquarters and just developed this body of, of work and, and was really, I think, a lot of people identified me as, as the foremost journalist, you know, in the world, really, that understood and was writing about how this was changing agriculture and what it was doing to environmental health, um, you know, because there were a lot of benefits, but there were also a lot of, of downsides, a lot of costs um, that were coming along with, with this Roundup Ready system and with this extraordinary use of this pesticide. So, um, in the year 2015, um, a publisher came to me and said, would you write a book about this? You're, you're writing all of these very interesting things, including stories that have been tying this chemical to, to cancer um, for many years, well before the rest of the, the world started talking about it, I guess. And uh, I said, I don't know. I don't, I don't think people really want to read a book about a pesticide. And my publisher said, yeah, I think, I think they do. So Left, left Reuters and in 2016 started writing my book and, and it was published in 2017. Um, and, uh, you know, boy, <laughs> you know, pretty much everything that I wrote in that book that people thought was so controversial, you know, has now all been laid out in these um, three Roundup cancer trials. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a big, a big thing and changed my life uh, quite a bit. I've been asked to speak all over the world now about about the book and the findings. And um, so it's, it's an interesting story. And my publisher turned out to be right, I guess. It was a good idea to write the book. I, well, well, we're sure glad you wrote the book because, uh, you know, really, there really wasn't, there was a lot of um, uh, fear mongering, honestly, about this, but not a whole lot of people who have sat down and really wrote the, the story of this product. And so we, we, I really got that from your book, uh, especially, you know, the early days when uh, it was really sold and marketed as kind of the, the savior of farming, right? That this was going to be the most, um, I think you, you had a scientist in your book, uh, call it environmentally benign, right? That this was going to be this pest, this magic pesticide, herbicide, excuse me, that will, uh, uh, save the day. Um, uh, could you explain a little bit of, you know, the, the, how that progressed from there to where we are today? Yeah, exactly. And, um, and that is, I guess I didn't do a good job of describing whitewash, but yeah, the book is, is you know the story of a weed killer cancer and the corruption of science and it really encompasses um, all of these you know political and food policy and agricultural policy and environmental health and human health all of these different stories are intertwined in in the case of Monsanto and this one one chemical and when they introduced this it was indeed marketed as being the safest you know so much more safe than many other herbicides that were on the market. And, it, and in truth, it was. I mean, farmers were using Paraquat, for instance, um, to do burn down and other things. And, and Paraquat, you know, as I talk about in the book, and your farmers will know this, uh, can, be, can be quite 
deadly, you know, on an acute basis. Um, if you are exposed in the wrong manner, if you if you take in some orally or something, you can die within a few weeks. So glyphosate in comparison uh, was much safer. The problem is, is the extreme amount of use that Monsanto pushed into the farming community um, with these Roundup Ready crops, with, with the idea that we should desiccate crops like wheat and oats. And, and the way that they marketed this is so very safe that the users, household users and others, didn't necessarily need to worry, Monsanto would say, about wearing protective gear, for instance. You know, you could go out in your shorts and your sandals and spray this. Um, and what we've found over the years is that uh, scientific studies done by independent scientists have found that this is actually quite damaging to human health and uh, the surfactants that are combined in Roundup and, and the other formulated products like Ranger Pro um, are particularly um, promoting uh, uh, to DNA changes and damage and that, that they actually help it absorb into the skin and they help this actually migrate into the bones. Um, internal Monsanto memos talk about their own employees who are who are applying these chemicals and they want them to wear a whole you know top to bottom and gloves and boots and masks and, and everything and yet to the consumer they're saying don't worry about it it's so safe you don't even need to wear any protective gear and you know so tracking that story and tracking how they tried to suppress independent science and harass scientists but how they then also ghost wrote and promoted um, their own studies to sell this product and to sell the safety of it and to convince regulators that it didn't need to be heavily restricted that they didn't need danger sign you know danger on the label um, it's really a long story of you know I guess what the title says a, a corruption of the scientific literature to such a degree um, you know that really has endangered public health uh, as well as well as environmental health and that's a whole s different subsection but uh, you know, there's a lot there to unpack, and it really is important for farmers, I think, to understand, you know, the deeper story behind behind Monsanto's propaganda. Sure, and, and it's it boy, it still seems like that is going on today. That um, you know, even as I talk to people, and, and I have friends who are scientists, and they're not in agriculture, and and you know, I've I've had this argument with a couple of them who really b truly believe that this is a hoax that this is something that there's a conspiracy uh, and that there's really no proof at all um, and that this is mass hysteria. Uh, you know, and, and, and you know, I come at it from it where I can walk a field and I can know whether it's a glyphosate field or an organic field just by picking up the soil and looking at the plant health. Uh, they don't have that benefit of the doubt. So how do we explain this to them? And, and what do, what's your reaction when you still get that today? Well, I mean... So there are two reactions, I guess. I mean, if, if people believe it's a hoax, um, and it, and by that, do they do they think that the cancer connection is a hoax? Um, I mean, that tells me they just haven't read the science. You know, they haven't done their homework and they haven't read the science. They've been listening to Monsanto and Bayer and their chemical industry front groups that they have set up. Uh, you know, and I document those front groups in the in the book. It's not sort of opinion. It's not you know just a a, um, a guess. It's documented in internal email communications uh, where Monsanto is secretly paying and setting up you know organizations like the American Council on Science and Health and Academics Review and and others um, specifically to look like independent scientific organizations that will say it's a hoax, <laughs> um, you know, and setting up Twitter accounts and, and uh, networks all around the world actually to, to combat the science and to say this is a hoax. You see it in their own words, in their own internal emails. Um, so it's not a hoax. Um, there are uh, an array, not just cancer, but an array of of different health impacts. And I don't know why that would be so surprising to people. I mean, our, our US government certainly understands, and most farmers do understand, that the pesticides that they use, and herbicide is a pesticide, is classified as a pesticide, um, they are dangerous. They are, they are designed to be toxic to plants or insects or you know, other, other life form um, to help farmers. So to, to understand that they also can be dangerous to humans shouldn't 
shouldn't be that hard of a, <laughs> of a leap, I guess. The question is about understanding, from my perspective, it's about understanding the risks so that you can properly take precautions, you can properly steward the use of these chemicals. It's about responsibility, accountability, transparency. Um, it, you know, there, there are people on, on the sides that want to just yell at each other and say it causes cancer. No, it doesn't. You know, that's, that's not useful, uh, I don't think. That, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I appreciate you answering that one. I know that because um, uh, it kind of gets to the heart of that day-to-day conversation, you know, that we're having. And and, uh, and I want to just make sure that everybody understood that what we're talking about is established by science, right? That this isn't coming out of left field or this isn't just a set of anecdotes that we're piecing together. That there's been this, the, the studies ha- are, are out there and they're, they're coming out during these trials. Um, there, there are many studies that have been done over the years, toxicology studies, which are done with experimental animals, epidemiology studies where you follow large numbers of people who are exposed and, and others who are not exposed, um, and mechanistic studies where you actually in the laboratory are looking at a chemical impact on human cells. And, and all of those have been done by independent scientists, including some of the most you know, highly regarded scientists around the world, scientists who are so highly esteemed that the EPA has brought them in and said, please sit down with us and advise us. Those scientists have told the EPA that they are not assessing the science correctly, that they're violating their own rules in, in giving a pass uh, to Monsanto's chemicals. We have internal emails from the EPA where they essentially say they're not going to pay attention to the science. They're going to have Monsanto's back um, on this. I mean, from the very early days, a, a rat, st- a mouse study that Monsanto actually paid for um, and gave to the EPA in 1983, the EPA's own scientists said, this looks like it causes cancer. This is affecting um, tumor growth in mice who are exposed. And so the science dates back decades, um, but Monsanto's attempt to cover up the science also did, dates back decades. I, uh, thanks. I, I don't know if we can repeat that enough, but I appreciate that. Uh, the, um, uh, before we get into this year real quick, I just wanted to talk about one thing that, that and it's, it's coming up in the trial this year, so I just wanted to set this as a kind of the foundation before we go into the trial uh, and, and your coverage is um, how... Roundup and, and glyphosate was used beyond farming, right? That at some point, this also became adapted by cities, towns, railroad companies, et cetera, for just land management practices. Uh, when did that start to occur? Well, very early on. I mean, in the 70s as well. Um, this, this has been used and is used by school districts and, and cities and counties and, you know, on public spaces. It's used by neighborhoods in their common areas, uh, used in forestry management. There's aerial spraying that, that goes on. Uh, it is, again, the most widely used uh, herbicide in the world. Um, just in agriculture alone, we've gone from about 40 million pounds used annually uh, in the mid-90s to close to 300 million pounds used annually now. And that's only in the United States. We're in the billions uh, worldwide. And that's only in agriculture. And then there's, you know, uh, quite a bit more used by people in, you know, their gardens and and lawns. And and actually, the the plaintiffs that we've seen so far in the three trials, none of them were farmers. Um, They were either individual homeowners using it on their properties, or in the very first trial, it was a school groundskeeper who was uh, spraying it regularly on various school properties. Um, well, that's a good segue into this year. And uh, uh, since you're a journalist and you write these all the times, uh, and we can get into the details, what would be the headline for this year to kind of summarize all the coverage that you've been doing out there? Is there is there a way to do that? <laughs> Boy, did Bear make a mistake. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sounds um, about right. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, yes, I mean, um, chickens coming home to roost. I mean, I've, you know, used that one before, but... Yeah, I mean, we've seen over the last uh, nine months, has it been 10 months, nine months, um, you know, a culmination of what's what I've been writing about and saying is, is coming for many, many years is this, the body of scientific evidence uh, that Monsanto has been denying exists or denying is valid, uh, is is being laid out in a public, public venue, in a public spotlight, um, and expert 
scientists are coming in to testify about it. And uh, what you're finding is juries, you know, three of them now who say, yeah, looks like this stuff causes cancer. And Monsanto has been lying about it. Um, and that's why you're seeing these verdicts and these huge punitive damage awards because uh, the internal communications show that Monsanto did not ever do anything uh, to try to manage public risk. They were trying to manage profit growth uh, and profits were taking priority over public health. seems like there's a lot of parallel between the Purdue pharmaceutical trials and the Monsanto trials uh, this year with uh, uh, seeing greed over public benefit and losing the mission of your, your company a little bit, uh, side point, don't really need to talk about that, but, um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, in the trials, there's an, has there been a witness that stands out or a testimony that really stood out that kind of, that was, uh, really encompassed, you know, the research you've done and really kind of hit home to you when you remember? Well, I mean, none of it's been surprising to me per se, um, you know, because, because I, I had a lot of this, um, the, the book, the evidence that's in the book and laid out is, is not just internal Monsanto documents, but also internal EPA, FDA, and USDA documents that, that I was able to get from um, Freedom of Information requests. And I actually had to sue the EPA um, a couple of times to get them to comply. And I'm, in, I'm currently in the middle of another um, sort of battle with them for some documents that they don't want to turn over. But um, what you see, you know, is is that the regulators to a degree appear to be um, maybe not complicit. Collusion might be too strong of a word, but maybe not. Uh, I mean, you do see where EPA worked very closely with Monsanto to kill off um, a review by the uh, ATSDR, which is part of Health and Human Services. Um, they were not successful in completely killing it, but they did delay, delay the toxicity review three years um, to help Monsanto out. Um, the ghost writing, I think when you talk to the jurors, um, and you see what really resonates with jurors and with, with spectators and the public, uh, it's this notion of ghost writing, that this was such a common practice at Monsanto that they, that's what they call it. They call it ghost writing. They talk about, Hey, we ghost wrote this paper. We should ghost write another, um, one email communication, uh, from one of their scientists. It's, I mean, it's so blatant. He, he says, I've written this paper, really would like to get it out there, you know, but it'll look better if it comes from a non-mon, meaning non-Monsanto um, source, trying to find an academic, but they don't want to slap their names on something that they didn't write. Uh, and he's having problems finding somebody, um, but, he's, but he's working diligently to do it. I mean, that it's just it's a blatant uh, corruption of the literature because if you see a paper and you know it's written by a Monsanto person, you know, you're, it, it has a certain context, right? And, and you have a certain understanding about how to take that information. But when you have papers in the scientific literature that appear to be completely independent of Monsanto and they say this, this chemical is completely safe, you have a different view. And in fact, what's happened uh, one very important paper to the EPA was Williams, Crows, and Monroe, three different authors, none of them uh, working uh, employees of Monsanto. And this was a very big, broad look at glyphosate and concluded that it was just completely safe. And the EPA has cited this study um, many times in saying, yeah, we, we find glyphosate to be safe. And you, the, the EPA does not do its own studies they look at other studies. Monsanto handed them this study and said, you should look at this William Crows and Monroe. We see in the internal documents that it was Monsanto's own scientists who wrote the majority of that paper. And these, these authors are getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars or receiving grants, right? I mean, huge amounts of money for these studies. Well, what, you know, I mean, you'd have to define what you consider huge. Yeah, I sure. think that's pretty different people. Yeah, have good point. Time. Yeah. Um, but you do see, yes, they're paying a lot of these people. Um, they, we have copies of contracts uh, with authors, and they say in their internal emails, we'll pay these guys to edit and sign their names um, to papers that we do the majority of the writing. Um, so, you know, and that's not disclosed um, anywhere. So, 
you know, it, it really is a corruption of the scientific literature. And, th and that's just one aspect of the deception. Um, as I said, they set up front groups, um, different organizations that appear to be independent, uh, that can defend the safety of their products. Um, and yet they're, you see in the emails, you know, that they're sending money back and forth. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's messy and it's disappointing um, that this is, this happens um, and it's all designed to confuse consumers and farmers and everybody. Well, that's why we're glad you're helping us sort this out and bring it to light. And, you know, just, just to recap what we've covered already is, you know, this has been going on for some time. Uh, the science has proven that there is a, a definitive negative human health effect for being exposed to glyphosate and Roundup products yet we are still seeing massive amounts of misinformation and, and a really organized campaign to uh, cover up that information and from getting to the people who are using it and uh, the stores that are selling it. Um, uh, there's certainly, uh, uh, I can't, you know, there's certainly, we're not seeing Monsanto certainly withdraw the product, pull it back and, and say we made a big mistake at this point either. Uh, so, uh, you know, looking at the trials a little bit, you, or you're talking to jurors, what, what happens next? You know, they've, they, the spotlight's on them. They've been exposed. What happens now? Right. Well, um, next week, uh, I guess I'm not sure when this podcast runs, but on May 22nd, there's a hearing in federal court. And the judge in the, in the federal court, uh, Judge Vince Chabria, has essentially ordered Bayer, who, which bought Monsanto last summer, to come to the table and start engaging in settlement talks. Um, he has ordered mediation between the plaintiff's attorneys. There's a team of plaintiff's attorneys, about five to six law firms that are sort of, um, you know, acting and overseeing all of the 13,000 <laughs> lawsuits that are filed and uh, 13,000 plaintiffs, I'm sorry, who have filed lawsuits. So they are to come to the table. Now, Bear has, has, you know, indicated that maybe it's not really ready to talk settlement. Uh, they want to see how their appeal is going. They've appealed the very first uh, verdict that went against Monsanto uh, and plan to appeal these last two that just occurred. So we don't know. Um, there's a lot of investor pressure on Bayer right now. Investors are very unhappy um, with Bayer because, of course, their share price has, has dropped precipitously since the first trial. Um, shareholders are very angry. Why did um, Bayer pay $63 billion for this company just to be opened up to all of this bad press and this liability? Um, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of pressure there. Many cities um, around the country are, are banning glyphosate now. They're they're pulling it out of school districts. Um, you see different retailers that are, you know, Costco for one has stopped selling glyphosate products. Uh, insurance companies are, are looking at, at some of their users like in the golf course industry and talking about not wanting to provide insurance if they're going to be using glyphosate products. Um, so, you know, a, a, there's a lot of fallout uh, from this very clearly. That makes, makes sense. Um, it, amid all the fallout, and I, I really don't ever want this... Um, uh, podcast to be political, but there are some political considerations behind this that we haven't seen the investment in the EPA or the watchdog organizations um, with the current administration out there. Um, is and I guess the, behind that, I guess the real question is: Is this going to stick, or is this a phase that you know that we're going through right now? Or, or and how do we get it to stick? Would be another way to ask that at some point. And how do we get change to happen with this information? Well, the, the White House and the Trump administration, you know, is sort of dug in their heels and essentially said, you know, we've got your back. In fact, I, you know, when it comes to Monsanto, I, you know, reported recently on, on some internal communications in which a domestic policy advisor at the White House is reported to have said, we have Monsanto's back on pesticide regulation. We are prepared to go toe to toe on any disputes they may have. Um, so, you know, Clearly, the Trump administration, and you, you don't see this only with Monsanto, you saw it with Dow Chemical and Chlorpyrifos, uh, their insecticide that, that you know, is so dangerous, the Obama administration had called for it to be banned, actually scheduled it to be banned from agricultural use in 2017, and the Trump administration met with Dow Chemical and uh, said, you know what, we're going <laughs> to delay that ban indefinitely. Um, so they seem to be on the same path with glyphosate. Uh, 
but that's just sort of, I think, a, a deregulation um, industry, company, corporate friendly kind of view that the, the administration has overall. Um, so I don't expect that we're going to see any tighter regulations or restrictions, certainly from the EPA anytime soon. Uh, it's all coming, you know, from from the grassroots, uh, from consumer groups and environmental groups and and others uh, and grain handlers as well. You know, I've talked to grain handlers who are putting into their contracts that farmers are not allowed to desiccate uh, their wheat or their oat crops, for instance. Uh, they don't want grain if it's been desiccated with glyphosate just before harvest. So, you know, you're, you're seeing that that uh, industry, food industry is aware of the consumer concerns and, and they are uh, reacting accordingly to, to also try to limit the use of this and to limit exposure through our diet. Makes makes sense. And yeah, and as Charles Massey wrote in his book, that there's never a a straight line to change. You know, there's always dotted lines uh, going everywhere. Um, so, but uh, all that's really positive. I think, uh, you know, as far as the human health concept is concerned, all that is very, very positive. Uh, yeah, I, I make the case in my book though, and, and I do like to point out, um, it, it is, this is much bigger than glyphosate or Roundup or Monsanto. I, I see the company and the chemical as sort of a poster child uh, for the bigger problem because you, you make glyphosate go away. A lot of people say, let's ban glyphosate. You don't, you haven't really solved anything. Um, we have a pesticide pervasive agricultural system that's been pushed down our throats literally by these handful of companies that make all of this, you know, billions of dollars off these special seeds and chemicals. And, uh, you know, we, while it might work great in the short term for farmers, it, it doesn't work great in the long term for anybody. Um, and, and I explore that in the book, and I think your listeners probably understand that better than than most. But uh, you know, we've created a whole lot of problems with you know soil health and and water quality and air quality and uh, you know biodiversity loss of very important pollinators and you know there's a a whole lot of outcomes separate from the health question that are very important, maybe more important that need to be addressed. I 100%, I am standing in my chair applauding that because that, you know, that's, that's, uh, our last guest, Glenn Rabenberg was talking about that as well. He, you know, he's a soil expert and, 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 you know, we're getting, we need to get back to the basics. I mean, and that was his approach was, you know, we got to start talking about photosynthesis again. This has been lost out of our farming conversation, you know, just basic fundamentals of growing. And, uh, and even having the growers understand the basic uh, fundamentals of photosynthesis because they haven't had to with the, the chemical system and being chemically dependent. So it, it really is a, a it, there's a lot of education that we, we need to start with. And so hopefully that's where Acres USA can come in. That's really why we started this podcast is to create a microphone to help people just attach to this idea. Uh, we're certainly not going to teach people how to do it on this podcast, but we just, you know, we're letting people know that there are those materials out there. Uh, and instructors and conferences and books and there's there's a hundred methods out there to grow uh, more than that there's an infinite amount of methods to grow uh, healthy food um, uh, out there we just, but finding that system that works for your farm and your region and your what you want to grow is really the, the hardest the hardest part for a lot of farmers so um, you dedicated your book to farmers uh, what would you ask farmers to use this information for well, uh, you know, just <laughs> to to be better informed, to better protect themselves and, and their families and, and the future generations. Um, you know, I, I'm not someone who says we should ban glyphosate. I'm not someone who says we should ban all pesticides and, and be a purely organic system. Now, you know, uh, that would probably be the best for all of us, um, you know, health-wise and environmental-wise. I don't know if it's workable. Um, I, don't, I don't know that my opinion on that is actually matters. I'm a journalist and my job is to bring facts to light. So I think what the facts show us is that we've gotten completely out of balance. You know, we, there is a lack of balance. There is a lack of understanding of risk uh, that comes with the reward. And, and people need to contemplate more judicious if they do feel like they need to use a pesticide. I mean, really contemplate that. And, and what is a more judicious use and how do you scale back instead of scaling up? Um, you know, because what glyphosate has led us to, of course, is uh, aside from, you know, all of these other things is, is weed resistance problems. 
that you know have taken over a hundred million acres of of farmland in the U.S. and created. I have farmers here in Kansas who are still planting Roundup Ready corn, yet they're tilling their fields because. The, the Roundup they spray on their Roundup Ready corn doesn't kill the, the weeds anymore. They've been using more and more and more of the glyphosate herbicides. It's not doing the job. You know that, and also in the Midwest, they've introduced now new GMO soybeans and other things. So you can spray them also with dicamba and glyphosate or also with 2,4-D and glyphosate. More and more and more. And, you know, it's, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a treadmill. Uh, we're not getting anywhere. Um, other than, you know, a more environmental decimation. So we, we really need, farmers need to just, you know, contemplate the long-term view. I, 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 I love, and that's really it. And it's so hard to do when you're running a business, you know, and, and trying to, to, to pivot and transition. And so uh, hopefully uh, those growers out there that are really stuck and really trying to figure that out there, there are a lot more resources out there and, and people who have done this than even there were 10 years ago. And so we're just finally getting to that critical mass of people and information out there to really provide systems and some support for that, that folks. You mentioned dicamba. Uh, we could probably spend a whole hour just on that one too. Um, right. Uh, it seems like that one's a, a little bit out of the radar uh, compared to um, Roundup and glyphosate right now. Uh, dicamba is obviously a big concern with farmers, but not much outside of farming right now, it seems like. Uh, what are you seeing with dicamba? What's, what's its future? Well, yeah, I mean, dicamba, you know, is an older herbicide. Um, it's been around for a long time. Um, Monsanto, uh, as the weed resistance problems with glyphosate uh, ramped up after telling us for many, many years and telling the EPA that there would be no weed resistance problems, Monsanto finally did sort of start acknowledging that around 2011, 2012. And, um, uh, ramped up production of dicamba. You know, this was another profit opportunity for the company. They'd created this weed resistance problem, so now they could offer a solution uh, with with marketing a new type of dicamba um, that you know they have said and argued that is less volatile, as you understand well, and your farmers do. Dicamba is something you wouldn't typically use in the warmer growing months because of its volatilization issues. It doesn't stay where you want it to stay and it can then destroy neighboring farm fields. Um, so, but Monsanto's new plan is, oh, we have a new, you know, new formulation and yes, you can spray it uh, in the warmer months and spray it on all of these, you know, acres that are so weed resistant on these new genetically engineered crops. And of course it's created a, just a disaster in farm country, um, for a number of farmers, um, you know, we've one farmer shot another farmer and killed him over a dispute because his fields had been damaged and um, there are lawsuits and all sorts of things going on. So, uh, you know, I don't know if it's really under the radar. Um, so far, it's working great for Monsanto because more and more farmers, even if they don't want the new genetically engineered dicamba tolerant seeds, they're buying them anyway. They say just to protect themselves uh, if their neighbors are spraying and it drifts over onto them. So, you know, again, and, and our FDA uh, is ramping up its pesticide residue testing. They test food, uh, thousands of food samples every year to look for pesticide residues and determine if they're at dangerous levels. They've uh, talked about ramping up their testing for dicamba and 2,4-D because they're expecting a lot more residues to start showing up in, in food because of this uh, new use. So, you know, so a, lot, a lot going on. <laughs> There's job security for Kerry Gillum in the future, I guess. That's, that's what we're... Um, <laughs> uh, I guess let's talk, can we talk about how this is covered with you know as and your peers cover you know and and you know obviously I'm, I'm a journalist as well and kind of how we cover farming um I, I you know I, I I always especially with environmentalism I started kind of as a rivers and mountains and creeks environmental reporter and found farming that way I grew up on farms but it took me a while to reconnect um through that method but I you know when I was really covering it we didn't talk a lot about farming and agriculture and maybe it was perhaps where I was located in the region I was working in but um it seems like there's still there's still some uh, a gaps of really bringing together the the folks covering climate change and the folks covering um you know maybe open space and environmentalism issues in that way and the folks like yourself covering agriculture and input and uh, do you see the same thing or am I way way wrong there 
Um, no, I mean, I, there, there's been just a, a, there's a whole shift change going on in journalism anyway, you know, in terms of, of what, what outlets are looking at and how outlets are being formed and paid and that sort of thing. And, and very definitely environmental and agriculture in my mind anyway, is sort of one and the same thing, right? <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I could see how others don't. I mean, my father, for instance, is constantly saying, you know, why are you paying so much attention to agriculture? Why don't you write about climate change? And uh, of course it's all very closely connected. Um, but I, I think the press, at least, you know, for, for many years, for, for decades, actually, um, the farm press in particular has, has given very little heed to the warnings um, that came with Monsanto and its chemicals um, and, and all of this that's going on now. And in large part, I think that's because they rely on these companies for money, I mean, for advertising dollars and, and support. And the same is true with the big, you know, the corn growers and the soybean growers and um, these big associations, you know, they get money, they get support from the companies and they, they, there's very little upside to, to challenging their narrative, to challenging their propaganda. Um, and you see that in mainstream press as well, uh, to a certain degree. And, and a lot of reporters just have not, not had the knowledge or the experience. They haven't followed the story uh, for years. If you come in and you, you've just starting to cover this industry and, you know, Monsanto sets you down and tells you how it is. And, and they have all of these groups that look like they're independent and they tell you how it is. And yeah, I mean, I could see how you would be confused. Um, but if you've been following the evolution of it since the nineties, like I have, uh, it's not confusing at all. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Thanks for asking. That. I think that's, you know, how we educate the public is really the other way to ask that question. And, and, uh, um, I, I do, I do see folks starting to finally write about this and uh, not finally, but write about this more in mass. I'll put it this way. Uh, right. so, so yeah, another, another sign that we're, we're making a dent or that there's progress, uh, at least on the, the education side, public, ed, you know, happening. Um, what's next for you? Do you have another book project you're working on? What's coming next? Uh, I am working on another book, um, which I'm not going to talk about at this point, I guess. I'm working on a book. There, um, there, there are a lot of movie people floating around trying to figure out how to take all of this and, and make a movie about it. Um, so that would be quite, quite interesting and fun if, if that ever did happen, I think. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a big story. Um, when you have a, a large, you know, international company uh, that engages in this type of deception for so many years with a product that is so ubiquitous and that, you know, many people just have in their garage and, and is in our food and in our air and water and in our own bodies. So, um, you know, I hope they can figure out a way to make a movie about it. But in the meantime, I'm just, you know, continuing to dig through documents, fight with the EPA for data and documents and, um, you know, trying to keep writing. Uh, I work at, you know, at US Right to Know Now, the nonprofit research group, and uh, we're small and little, and uh, the chemical industry keeps trying to kill us off. Um, <laughs> they're, they are attacking us right and left and trying to discredit us, just like uh, they try to discredit, you know, these cancer scientists for all these years. So um, wow. it's a challenge. Every day is a challenge. Sometimes when, yeah, I guess when you're, when you're covering that, I guess you expect it to get some bruises along the way. Um, you know, that's going to come with it. Uh, uh, I know we could talk for hours about this, but I, I wanted to, you've done such a nice job of, of outlining um, really the challenges to farmers right now is, is, is how do we get out of this, this system? And you mentioned it, your opinion probably doesn't matter, but uh, you know, I wanted to just ask you again, one more, you know, kind of, uh, in, in this, it, it, this is more of a, maybe a metaphysical question. Um, a lot of our listeners, you know, they listen to this. There's huge challenges out there. And I always ask every, every guest, why, why do we have hope? Why continue the work? Why continue reporting on this when the challenges are out there? Um, I always get a really good answer with that question. But, um, you know. <laughs> well, I probably will disappoint you. <laughs> so, so why have hope, Carrie Gillen? Well, I, I, so two things, I think. First of all, I think information is power. And I think when the information is out there, which it is, you know, getting out there in spades right now um, with all of these trials in public spotlight, 
Um, when information is out there, uh, people are inherently good and, 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 you know, working for the betterment of all of us. I think very, very few people are, are short sighted and evil and selfish. I mean, we're all in this together. It takes a village. It truly does uh, to better our world and protect our future generations. And, and farmers are, as I say in my book, I mean, I think the most important industry, you know, out there, we all eat, we all rely on farmers and farmers, have the hardest job and and uh, you know I, they don't do it to make money I don't think <laughs> from the farmers I know they do it because they care uh, they care about the land and they care about their kids and the future and, and people and um, so I think information is power I know a lot of farmers uh, are part of a group now called the idea farm network and there are probably many others that, that are working together to come up with new strategies so we can get off the pesticide treadmill so um, I see a lot of reason for hope. That was an interview with Carrie Gillum on May 15th, 2019. Stay tuned to her coverage on the ongoing Monsanto trials at kerrygillum.com. Uh, and thank you for listening to another episode of Tractor Time brought to you by Acres USA and BCS America. You can subscribe to our channel on YouTube, iTunes, or anywhere podcasts are available. Also find us on www.acresusa.com, ecofarmingdaily.com. Also check out bcsamerica.com. Please visit our sponsors. And also don't forget to subscribe to our monthly magazine. Thank you for listening and have a great weekend.